Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is John Hazlett. I'm the district manager for the Marion County Soil and Water Conservation District, and welcome to our 51st annual meeting. This is one like any other. Um, usually we do meet in person and have a nice dinner and networking together along with our speaker. But of course, everything's different uh, with COVID. So we really appreciate uh, everyone taking the time to log in to Zoom and to hear a little bit about what our district has been up to. Um, and we're also gonna have Doug Talamy speaking today as our guest speaker in a little bit. I wanna remind everyone that spring is in 32 days. And, uh, and again, thanks for taking the time and I, between shoveling snow and everything. Just a few meeting logistics before we get started. I wanted to let everyone know, know that due to the high number of attendees, all the attendees have been muted and cameras are turned off. Um, we do ask for your patience if any we have any technical glitches. This is our first time holding an annual meeting virtually uh, and we, we are recording this as well. So you'll be able to go back and watch later if you miss anything. I also want to note that during the business portion of our meeting, meeting um, prior to Doug Talamy speaking, um, uh, we will have uh, the, the chat on, but we ask that you only use the chat if you're having technical difficulties. If you have questions about the services we provide or any of the things you hear about with regard to the business portion of the meeting, we ask you to use the contact us section of our website and that uh, website is marionswcd.org and we will be following up with you that way. I also would like to say a quick thank you to our primary fund funder, which is the city of Indianapolis Department of Public Works. And uh, we, we're gonna talk a lot of, about partnerships uh, tonight or today, and, and they certainly are one of our key partners. We also have a door prize a sponsorship through Indiana Farm Bureau and want to thank them um, for their contribution on that. And lastly, I just wanna thank all of our uh, board and staff uh, that make make uh, just a pleasure for me to come to work every day whether that be in person or or virtually so just to, in terms of our agenda here we're going to do some of the uh, highlights from 2020 and staff updates um, by district staff as part of our business portion of our meeting we're also going to do a few part have a few partners uh, provide updates uh, specifically Natural Resource Conservation Service and the State Department of Agriculture. And then our board treasurer, Brian Nielsen, is going to give the treasurer's report as well as an overview of our uh, uh, board supervisor election process for 2021 as we do have two open board supervisor positions this year. We'll turn to hear uh, Professor Talamy speak about uh, native plants and insect interactions. And then at 5.30, we're gonna do a, a door prize giveaway. We have two books, two Talamy books that we're gonna pull uh, raffle style. Um, so you'll wanna stay, stick around for that as well as the closing remarks. So I'd like to just say a few things from, from my perspective as, as a district manager. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about and a lot of what staff will be talking about is in our uh, annual report that's up on our website recently that recently came out and captures everything. Um, we did have some staff changes this year and that um, Cheyenne Hoffa, our previous urban conservationist, moved on to a, a position in the private sector. And we were lucky enough to pick up Elena Jones, who started in September and has really hit the ground running. She's just been awesome um, doing uh, construction site inspections for our district. And that's through our MOU with the city of Indianapolis. Um, we've also been hard at work in 2020 on an update of the Lower Fall Creek Watershed Management Plan that was originally completed in 2009. Um, that plan needed updated not only because it was 11 years old, but it also uh, needed a few updates to meet the current EPA uh, checklist for watershed management plans. We've got that submitted to the plan update submitted to IDEM and I'm waiting for feedback on that so we can apply for uh, 319 implementation funding uh, through IDEM. Uh, primarily for that plan update, we utilized a, a partnership with Reconnecting to Our Waterways. 
the Fall Creek Committee that served as the uh, project committee for that plan update. Uh, we had a series of public meetings, both virtually and in person before COVID really hit um, and identified some of the key water quality concerns in the watershed. The item that you see on the bottom left uh, is actually from the project website that was created um, showing uh, the Lower Fall Creek watershed that covers a couple of different counties. Uh, a lot of great work also happened at Barton Park uh, as part of the, uh, in, in partnership with a number of the partners we worked on for the, the watershed plan, uh, removing invasives and planting natives and trees with land stewardship, uh, the city's uh, office of land stewardship, as well as uh, some row partners there. We had a few um, new grants that came in this year. We, we have our base funding through the city of Indianapolis through which for every dollar that came in from the city of Indianapolis, we were able to leverage $2.11 through various partnerships. Um, one of those was a, a grant through reconnecting to our waterways to help fund the watershed management plan update. We also were uh, lucky enough to be a subgrant to Friends of White River through the phase two of the uh, Nina Mason Pulliam Charitable Trust Friends or uh, Partners for the White River. So we're working on a stream steward guide for riparian property owners with that. And then finally, we have a new cooperative agreement with the Natural Resource Conservation Services Service that will take us um, through 2025 and is funding Kevin's position and some other outreach tied to soil health. The last two things I wanted to mention were um, a website, uh, the circlecitysisma.org site. The SISMA is a cooperative invasive species management area. Um, and we are partnering with um, uh, Nature Conservancy, Keeping Annapolis Beautiful Land Stewardship, uh, 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 Marion University, and a few other partners on helping uh, remove uh, or treat, identify and treat invasives throughout the city. So that's just a great resource. And I want to thank um, Carol Hooker, who I believe is on this meeting, um, for her work on that website and with the SISMA as a whole. Um, I'd like to just add one other item, which is to acknowledge, which is Senate Bill 389, uh, which would repeal the state uh, regulated wetlands law. Um, I believe one of my staff members is putting a link in the chat for more information about that bill, and we encourage you to reach out to your state representatives and let your voices be heard on that. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Elena Jones real quickly for our uh, urban conservation update. Go ahead, Elena. Um, so what I do for the Soil and Water Conservation District uh, is work on the Urban Conservation and Pollution Prevention Program. So that's primarily by helping improve compliance on sites that fall under Rule 5, what will soon be called the Construction General Permit, or CGP. Um, so effectively, sites where construction has disturbed an acre or more of land. Um, so I inspect sites and I work with contractors to ensure that best management and prevention practices are followed. Um, as John mentioned, I've just recently joined the district in September of 2020. I was fortunate to get a lot of really great training from some of the SWCD's board members um, and from some wonderful colleagues at the city and also from Cheyenne, their predecessor. Um, so I was really able to jump right in with the inspections and we did a ton of them this year. I think we did over 100 in December. Um, in 2021, the city will be shifting to a new permit with updated compliance requirements, um, but we're gonna continue essentially the same work. And we've seen some encouraging trends with compliance um, over the past couple of quarters uh, and couple of years really with sites. Um, so we're hoping to continue building on that in the coming year uh, and seeing increasing compliance um, and also increasing touch points with the different contractors uh, that work on all the sites. And oh, I'm hearing that my audio is not super great. Is that better? Sounds good, Elena. Okay. All right. Hopefully. Sorry about that, folks. Um, <laughs> so uh, a lot of that will be through increasing touch points with the different contractors. 
and really making sure that we're able to help um, where they might not know what best management practices need to be in place, where we can provide resources so that they have a great understanding of that, and then providing technical assistance visits if they reach out uh, and ask for us to come visit a site, which we've already been seeing more of in 2021. So that's really encouraging and we're super excited. Um, we're always happy to talk with you. So please don't hesitate to reach out for us if you have a question or if you see a site that you're wondering, maybe that doesn't look quite right. Uh, feel free to get in touch with us through the website um, and we will be happy to chat with you. And at this point, John, I think I will pass it back to you for the next section of the meeting. Thanks very much, Julie, or uh, Elena, sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, get things over to Julie Farr, who's our resource conservationist and does a private property drainage assistance work and is also working on the stream steward guide I mentioned earlier. Uh, Julie, are you, you out there? I'll uh, I am here, if you can hear me. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, welcome everybody. Um, uh, I am Julie Farr with the Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm the resource conservationist. And um, what I do is help landowners with um, various conservation needs that they might have. Um, this year we've had more calls than usual. Um, I think everybody staying home, um, you know, working from home uh, has gotten them to think a little bit more about their yards or their properties, um, maybe starting to think about how to deal with some of the problems that they have or some issues that they would like to um, highlight in their own yards to make better. So um, we've gotten drainage calls and erosion calls that we've helped out with. Um, we've also helped people um, who want to improve their properties by putting in rain gardens, bioswales, um, ponds, um, native plantings and trees. Uh, those kind of calls are um, some of the things that we've worked with people on. Um, in total, we ended up helping 252 landowners this year. Um, and most of those were actually um, on-site visits, um, helping them with specific um, issues that they had on their own properties. Um, another thing that we are able to um, help people with is uh, by providing information and fact sheets and um, links um, at our website, uh, which is, uh, you can find us at www.marionswcd.org. And um, on there, if you look under the About tab on the top, you'll find our newsletters um, and our annual reports. And um, if you uh, visit our blog um, regularly, you'll find um, our most up-to-date information as far as our activities and workshops and that kind of thing. Um, there's just a lot of information on our website. Um, we've tried to, to uh, highlight a lot of things that are just common questions that come up over and over again. And a lot of that information is, is found there on our website. So um, visit that as you can. Um, and then if you do have questions right now, the best way, the quickest way to get response from us is by going ahead and going on our website with the contact tab and um, just emailing us and we'll get back with you um, since we are primarily working from home and in the field. So uh, that's the, the quickest way to get a hold of us right now. Um, so if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to get a hold of us. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. And next up is going to be Kevin Allison, our soil health specialist. And uh, I apologize, the slides are taking a little bit long to change on my end, but hopefully uh, they adjust here. Kevin, I'm just going to unshare and reshare my screen. If that helps at all. Yep. How's that? Perfect. All right. Thanks, John. 
Um, yeah, so the Marion County SWCD um, helps provide folks that grow food with educational and technical assistance opportunities in soil health and urban agriculture. Uh, so we mainly focus on assisting growers and gardeners with like conservation practices like nutrient management and cover crops and mulching and crop rotation. And we actually focus a lot on nat native plantings this past year um, in association with one of our grants. But pretty much anything that's related to living soil and water quality um, is in our is in our wheelhouse. So and this usually comes by way of direct technical assistance, um, farm visits, and a lot of workshops. Um, even in 2020, we were able to conduct 17 trainings on topics ranging from soil health to beneficial insect management. Um, and we did this across a diversity of venues like local farms, um, our SWCD Eagle Creek Demonstration Garden, and the Indiana Small Farms Conference, Hort Congress, and Zoom. <laughs> um, so we were engaged in three really important grants um, for our district um, right now. Um, our 2019 to 2021 Indiana Department of Agriculture's Clean Water Indiana grant <laughs> is focused on workshops, as they all are. Um, but this one has a, a special emphasis on some on-farm soil health trials. So we've been working closely with a handful of urban farmers um, to basically like design and, and help them implement like three year crop rotations with vegetables, cover crops and reduced tillage. Um, and the goal there is just to kind of have a conversation around, you know, what's working and what's not and what works at different scales. So we're talking about germination success, crop productivity, weed suppression, and just try to see the, the practicality of different tactics um, that may be helpful on farms of this scale or even backyard gardens. Um, in 2020, we used our National Association of Conservation Districts Urban Agriculture Conservation Grant um, to work with native plants. So we partnered with the Parks Alliance's local nonprofit farm in the urban acres um, to serve as a demonstration site for insectary strips, uh, field borders and hedgerows. And the purpose there was to just enhance habitat for beneficial and pollinating insects around farms. Um, so we, we were also able to help Groundwork Indy and, as John mentioned, Indy's um, land stewardship at Barton Park. So when we applied for that grant, um, I think it was back in 2019, we anticipated large volunteer groups to help us plant like 3,500 plants <laughs> at Indy Urban Acres. So that couldn't happen. So I do want to give a special thanks to um, the staff, IUA staff, um, Indy, Indy Urban Acres staff, and all the small groups of gracious volunteers because even though the, the big volunteer groups couldn't happen, we, we did get the plants in the ground. Um, so I do remember all the blisters and the poison ivy and Ellie dragging irrigation lines across the fields. <laughs> um, but I think it's gonna be worth it when even next year and the year after when they're all flowering and just full of life. So looking forward to that. Um, this NACD, National Association of Conservation District grant funding also helped us create some resource documents and to put on a variety of workshops related to native plants, um, including tonight's presentation with Professor Towney. Um, so this is um, also big news for us. In 2020, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service accepted um, SWCD's proposal to enter into a five-year agreement with us to continue my technical position, um, a soil health outreach position, and just to continue to provide workshops and to do, um, do more Kind of just kind of keep doing what we do, <laughs> um, but you know, to also there's also some added deliverables there, um, and so we're going to be reviewing the Indiana's USDA technical documents to ensure they're inclusive of agriculture in the urban environment, and we're also going to be creating a soil health guide for gardeners, which I'm really excited about. It. Um, the USDA and RCS also launched a partnership with the Indiana Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts um, to increase soil health education statewide. Um, through supporting local districts and local working groups. Um, you y'all might be familiar with Ellie Blaine. Um, she was working as our SWCD's Soil Health Outreach Coordinator, um, and she was recently, recently named the Program Director of this new initiative. Um, so it's great to be able to continue working with her um, closely in that capacity, along with the NRCS and Purdue Extension and all these partners that are engaged in these USDA agreements. Um, with the hope of providing just continual opportunities for growers and, and the public to engage in soil health. Um, so yeah, last but not least, um, spring is on the way. Um, the Marion County SWCD Eagle Creek Demonstration Garden will be entering its fourth no-till season, which I'm excited about. Um, it's covered in cover crops right now, but the vegetable seeds have arrived and I can't wait. Um, so I encourage you all to just keep engaged with us 
as we put on more workshops. And if you're a grower that wants to talk about soil health on your farm, just please reach out. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kevin. And up next, we have Jared Chu from the Natural Resource Conservation Service. He's our district conservationist for uh, Marion and Hendricks County. And both uh, NRCS and uh, our next uh, slide, the, the State Department of Agriculture are part of the Indiana Conservation Partnership with which we do a ton of our work. So go ahead, Jared. Good to see you. Thanks, John. Good to see you all. Um, welcome to the annual meeting, virtual style. Uh, hope you all are doing well. Um, just thought I would focus a little bit this evening. Um, as John said, I work for the Natural Resources Conservation Service part of the USDA. Um, we partner with the Soil and Water Conservation District in a lot of ways. You heard several there <clears throat> as Kevin and John were talking about uh, many of the different things uh, that, that we're doing on a statewide level. But then also locally, um, in addition to also providing um, conservation technical assistance, planning uh, on conservation uh, practices and things like that, similar to what Julie and Kevin talked about. Uh, we also have uh, cost share programs through the federal farm bill. Uh, primarily, I would say most of the practices that are uh, utilized in Marion County flow through what we call the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, or we like to call it EQIP for short because we always have to have an acronym when it comes to uh, federal programs, as you know. But uh, just to highlight a few of the things uh, in 2020, um, really popular within the EQIP program is invasive species removal. Uh, we call it brush management is one of the practices. And um, we have a handful of uh, new and existing contracts um, this last year, uh, or I would say, uh, currently, you know, we've put in around $20,000 just in that in the last year or so um, in removing things like um, bush honeysuckle and winter creeper and those kinds of things. So um, certainly the work that you're doing with the SISMA there in Marion County falls right in line with that program. And so, uh, you know, you're always welcome to, to work with those folks and we do have some some applications in process right now. Um, in addition, we also uh, have worked with a farmer on some livestock practices. Uh, the picture you see down here on the left is actually a, a year round winter waterer, uh, helps with uh, improving production, um, allows the uh, animals to, to utilize the pastures more efficiently. So we worked with that producer on that as well as some rotational grazing, fencing, and um, pasture improvements. I think I have one more slide here. Um, John's gonna click to, I believe. It'll work. The next slide that he's gonna get to is just talking about um, high tunnels um, within, it's like he had to restart that again, huh? <laughs> it's okay. Um, but just to talk about the environmental quality incentive program when it comes to high tunnels, uh, we have funded several high tunnels throughout Marion County. And that's a, also a very popular um, practice that's in uh, within EQIP. Uh, we just had some, um, you know, I would say around thirty thousand dollars worth of high tunnels um, just in the last three or four years. So um, that's something you know as you speak with people who are interested in extending their growing season and certainly providing a local source of fresh food. Uh, we wanna help with those kinds of situations. So with that said, uh, thank you all. Um, I'll stick with the theme of spring is coming. So have a good evening. Thanks, Jared. And one more partner up, update before we get to our board treasurer and I, promise you that uh, Doug Tallamy is waiting in the wings to present here. Um, uh, Geneva Tyler from uh, State Department of Agriculture. Geneva, are you on? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, well, hi, everybody. My name is Geneva Tyler. I work for the Indiana State Department of Agriculture. And I just had a couple things I wanted to mention. Um, just a quick year in review. 
And um, my, the first thing I wanted to mention was actually launched just a couple of weeks ago on February 1st, the Indiana State Department of Agriculture, the Nature Conservancy and the United States Department of Agriculture's Risk Management Agency launched the Upper White River Crop Insurance Incentive Program. And farmers who plant cover crops on owned or rented acres will receive a $5 per acre crop insurance premium for this three-year program. Uh, farmers who plan to cover crops in the fall of 2020 are also eligible to apply. Currently, this program is only available to farmers in the Upper White region, and that includes Henry, Delaware, Madison, Hamilton, Tipton, and Randolph counties, but we're excited to see how this goes, and who knows, um, hopefully we can expand that further. In the fall of 2020, uh, last fall, the ISDA and the State Soil Conservation Board awarded over $975,000 in matching grant funds to 15 soil and water conservation districts and organizations through the Clean Water Indiana program. The three-year grants are awarded to districts and conservation groups to re reduce runoff and non-point sources of water pollution, whether it's ag land, urban areas, or eroding stream banks. And then just a few um, by the numbers, uh, I'll call it um, through ISDA and soil and water conservation district efforts statewide, we were able to complete over 1,075 surveys, designs, and inspections. And with those conservation practices on the land, that amounts to over 176 million pounds of topsoil stabilized to the state. And we calculate through the Region 5 model that that also equates to about 188,000 pounds of nitrogen and 94,000 pounds of phosphorus being reduced from entering Indiana waters. Um, again, that is just ISDA and soil and water conservation district efforts full, full, for a full picture of um, conservation partnership efforts, including NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I would need to go back to the ICP report, which I don't have quite yet but those are a few, that's a quick sneak peek of 2020 annual report numbers. And that's all I have, John. Thanks a lot, Geneva. And uh, last part of our business meeting here uh, before Doug speaks is our, uh, our treasurer's report and our election process. For that, we have our board treasurer, Brian Nielsen, who's also the head of our uh, elections committee. Brian, are you on? I am here, if you can hear me. Fantastic. Good afternoon and evening, everybody. Uh, it's always dangerous to provide me with the most exciting aspect of our show right before a vibrant speaker. Um, we are required to present as a public agency our, our finances. And so as part of every uh, annual meeting, uh, as you see, our income and our expenses um, are as presented and um, noting that our income has increased 4% with our expenses increasing 10%. And so John has his work cut out for him. As you've heard, we have some, some grants coming up and we have also other opportunities that we are pursuing. And so we will be looking to uh, take that with our current bank balance and uh, continue our operations uh, within budget go ahead and go into the, the next slide. Um, it offers the opportunity for talking elections to one, uh, give a shout out. Hi, Mary Hayes, just thought I'd point out that you're out there and I saw you. Uh, good to see you around. Um, we are doing something new as everybody has been for the last year. And so our first virtual elections um, will be via our website uh, we typically are able to do this in person and, and are able to do an actual ballot and nomination process there. And because uh, we are sitting and looking at a, a, a record uh, number of people at an annual meeting, thank you very much, everybody, um, we will be putting this in. I would, I would say that we are looking at two elected positions, and I'll get into a moment with why there are two at this point. Uh, the nominations and voting will be through our website as noted, marianswcd.org. And the nomination process will be opened on uh, um, today and will continue through Thursday with regards to then going to a ballot, the ballot election process. Uh, each person, uh, if you are a Marion County citizen, 
are able to cast a vote for one candidate. The process will be that the person who gets the most votes will be one position. The person who gets the other votes gets another gets the other position, a uh, second amount of votes. And from that perspective, that will then set forth uh, both replacement and new position uh, on the supervisors. With that, um, there's a sad part to change. And that sad part is the two positions are because we have had two resignations, uh, Blake Wilson and Scott Miner off of our board. And, and as such, um, it will take us many years to screw up what Blake has done for us, but we will, we will give it a college try. Blake has, has been instrumental in getting us organized and getting us uh, through our various moves uh, in place. And, and Scott has provided um, his background through his landscape architecture and other insights for the local urban areas. Uh, that will, we will miss both of them greatly. Um, they may argue that, but, but it, is, it is there. Before I go, I'd like to thank our board members, uh, that Blake and Scott as noted, uh, Heather Buck, Maggie Gegline, uh, thanking myself seems somewhat gratuitous, but um, along with that, our staff, our staff has done a heck of a job. Um, given that I have the most vibrant job telling numbers and, and voting, I'll give it over to our speaker for the day. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm actually going to uh, introduce Doug Bryan, but I wanted to let everyone know, too, that the election process that Brian just described, we are going to be sending a follow up note to all attendees of this meeting and all the details are on our website. Um, we, I, I would invite, before I introduce Doug, uh, I would invite everyone to stick around for two door prizes that we'll have at the end of this meeting where I'll be drawing uh, uh, numbers out of a hat and we'll be giving away two of Doug's books. Um, and also wanted to note that Doug's um, presentation uh, is funded with support by NRCS, National Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts, as well as Clean Indiana. Doug is a professor at the University of Delaware Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology, widely known for his book, uh, Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. And we are super excited to have you, Doug. Take it away, thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, well, this afternoon, I wanna to talk to you about what my idea of nature's best hope is. But before I do that, I wanna revisit what happened, not this fall, but the fall before that, a year ago. Uh, there was what we, we call an oak mast. All of the members of the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I stared at it and I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First it chewed a little hole and forced its head through. And the hole stayed little, but it forced its entire body through there. Kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally plopped down. Uh, this is a very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. Lots of things are after it. So it gets to safety by squirming and wiggling below the surface of the ground. It takes about 30 seconds and down it goes where it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And then within that chamber it converts itself to a pupa. And it stays there for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. This is what an acorn weevil looks like. Uh, many people think weevils have big noses, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. They take those mouth parts and they chew a hole down into the center of the acorn. The female turn around, turns around and lays an egg in that hole and that's how the larva gets down into the center of the acorn. Now you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the very next year like most insects would? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months for them to complete to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. That of course leaves a hole in the acorn, uh, a true vacuum. And you know, a nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives inside the holes made by acorn weevils as they leave acorns. And if they discover a brand new acorn, their old acorns falling apart. So they wanna, they wanna move their old colony into this new one. They recruit everybody, everybody gets excited about this and they start carrying the larvae and the eggs. Uh, it doesn't take long, about 30 minutes and pretty soon the entire colony is inside the new acorn. They post a guard at the door here, make sure nobody else comes in and they will live in this acorn for the next two years. Well, about this time in my story, uh, my wife says, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? 
my point is that uh, that's just one of, of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise most of nature. Here's another one, the relationship between jays and, and uh, oaks. Jays are the primary dispersers of, of uh, oak acorns. They fly up to two miles from the parent tree and then tap it below the, below the surface of the soil. The idea is to retrieve the acorn in the dead of winter, but they forget where they put an awful lot of them and they end up planting a lot of of oak trees. Found out this fall what is pollinating witch hazel. If you've ever wondered about that, you can read that it's uh, gnats and fungus flies and things like that. But if you go and look at the flowers, you never see anything on them. It really turns out the major pollinators are a group of moths that we call winter moths. Bicolored sallow is one of them. These moths fly very late, well after frost. I, I found a, a bicolored sallow on Christmas Eve this year. There was snow on the ground. And of course, witch hazel blooms very late. Uh, so whether witch hazel is blooming late to take advantage of winter moths or whether winter moths are flying late to take advantage of witch hazel, I don't know. But right now they're taking advantage of each other. You won't have breeding pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants because that is what they rear their young on. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the, the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have faciliae. That's the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. As a matter of fact, pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plant genera. So for example, uh, in the upper Midwest, there's at least 13 species of, of uh, native bees that can only reproduce on the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head. I could go on and on all night talking about nature specialized relationships. But today, these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, he looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem today, of course, is that leaving the country as it was is no longer an option. We didn't do that. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's, of course, because we have logged the country repeatedly. We've tilled it. We've drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the US, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We've polluted our skies, changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other such remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done this? Well, I guess we thought that the earth, our nest, was so, so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this at a pretty regular clip. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population gone. Now the UN is saying, well, we're going to lose a million species to extinction, possibly in the next 20 years. And I love the way they, they report these headlines as if it's just one more headline. I mean, they might as well say we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next one. Losing a million species is not an option, folks. It is simply not an option. Well, I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses, but it's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that's gonna take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical and psychological environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline uh, here. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, the great E.O. Wilson, probably the most famous biologist alive today, told us what it would mean if we were to lose our insects. And he told us way back in 1987 in this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if the flowering plants disappeared, that would change the not just the physical structure of our terrestrial ecosystems, but also energy flow through those, those habitats. 
it would disrupt the energy flows th so dramatically that it would cause the collapse of the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, and even many of our freshwater fish would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients now and all we would have is fungus and, and bacteria. Uh, and of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. Good news is uh, that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on it, on what we, we call ecosystem services, the products produced by healthy functioning ecosystems. Here's just a few things that plants uh, give us. We always look at ecosystem services in, a, in an anthropocentric way, but plants are producing these, these benefits for everything else as well. Like oxygen, they produce oxygen, pretty important. They clean our water, that's also important. Um, carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, using it to build the, the carbon to build their tissues, and then they pump the extra carbon into the ground. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plants have, have deposited in the ground. And the soil scientists now tell us that the, our soils can sequester up to seven times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. We just have to get it out of the atmosphere, put it in the ground, and that's what plants do. They build topsoil, they hold it in place, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, all pretty important. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and other things. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is simply not an option. It never was a good option, but today with, you know, with 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet, it's a terrible option. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before. So wasting huge areas of the earth uh, in unproductive areas like this um, it's, it's just not an option. There were visionaries, have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the, the most eloquent, uh, wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is that the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now there have been indigenous groups that have been pretty good at doing that for uh, long periods, but our huge Western societies, our huge Asian societies are terrible at that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely spoiling an area. Then we go to another area and spoil that. And Aldo knew that that was not a sustainable way to deal with, with the earth. So we had uh, this dream uh, that we humans were actually capable of developing what he called a land ethic. And he wrote about this in the Sand County Almanac in his dream, we would, we would use the land, we'd farm it and lumber it and graze and mine, but we would learn how to do that gently without destroying local ecosystems, without taking more than the earth had to, had to offer. And that of course uh, is what he called a land ethic. What he didn't ever talk about was, was the concept of developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect that the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture. He may not have recognized it as an option. What I wanna argue this afternoon though, is that living with nature not only is an option, it now is the only viable option that's left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We need to turn that on its head now. We need to save nature, reconstruct it where there are a lot of people because that's most of the planet. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not just exist, but thrive. Where are we gonna start? Well, let's go back to private property. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. About 75% in the entire country is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're gonna fail uh, because then we'll be working with Otherwise, we'd be working with areas that are just too small, too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we need them to sustain. But there are other areas that uh, are, are not normally considered as options for conservation that we really could consider as options, like power and pipeline rights of ways. Huge amount of air. We got 21 million acres in power and pipeline rights of ways, 17 million acres of roadsides, 3 million acres of, of railroad rights of ways, 
golf course is 2 million acres, airports 3 million acres. You know, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are huge areas. And then of course we have all the places where we live, both in rural areas and suburbia, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres on in those properties. So if you add all that up, that's, that's uh, 599 million acres that we could be using for conservation that right now we're, we're really not. How big is 599 million acres? It's big. It's bigger than Vermont plus New Jersey plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana plus California. Even throw Texas in there. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We can do it just about anywhere. Now what I'm really talking about is reconstructing nature in areas where we have dismantled it. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to start with the most important species, the backbones of functioning ecosystems. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the, the species that other species depend on. And there are two main groups that we can't do without. Remember all those flowering plants that are, that are really running our, our terrestrial ecosystems? Well, you need the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. Absolutely necessary. So you have those plants, they're capturing energy from the sun, they're turning it into food, but now we have to get that food from the plant to animals or you lose all the animals. Uh, and it turns out that most vertebrates, in fact, don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. That's something typically is insects. And most of the insects that are eating plants and transferring energy successfully to other animals are caterpillars. So imagine what would happen if we designed landscapes that don't support a lot of caterpillars. All the energy remains, most of the energy will remain locked up in our plant tissues and we'd have failed food webs. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Now in Indiana, you've got the uh, black cap chickadee, but they're doing the same thing. During the winter, they, they at least 50% of their diet is seeds, but when it comes time to reproduce, their babies cannot eat seeds. That is true for most of the birds that are out there. So the chickadees switch to insects and if they're in a healthy environment, um, they will feed their young almost exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. It turns out that, that most birds are rearing their young on insects, 96% of our terrestrial birds rearing their young on insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Um, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that my, uh, one of my recent graduate students, Ashley Kennedy completed. She put out a call to bird photographers across the country uh, and asked them to send her pictures of uh, birds as they were bringing food to the nest. The object was that, that uh, Ashley was going to identify the prey items that were in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for the common birds in this country. And she got thousands of pictures. What you're looking at is the nestling diets um, of 20 of the common bird families in North America. And the green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we took caterpillars out of the system. Most of our birds would not be able to re reproduce successfully. So it seems something special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one is that they're relatively soft. Think of this guy as a, a, like a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is cuticle, it's exoskeleton, chitin, it is, it is undigestible. So the birds don't want a lot of that. And if the caterpillar is soft, the bird can stuff it down the throat of their, their babies without fear of injuring it. And have you ever watched a parent bird rear their young? They're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 ap aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein. They have a low percentage of chitin compared to most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. Uh, so much of a beetle is undigestible. And a lot of beetles have very sharp edges. And it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate, birds are vertebrates and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, uh, but we need carotenoids. We have to get them from plants because they are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure I have uh, lots of carrots because they give me my beta carotene and lots of tomatoes because they give me my lycopene and lots of whatever that is because they give me uh, lots of lutein. 
and if I eat a lot of, of those carotenoids, uh, my immune system is stimulated and I can't think of a better time to have a, a very active immune system. Carotenoids are also antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this male prothonotary warbler. He's bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. He makes makes uh, pigments out of those lutein's and puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Where are they getting their their carotenoids from? From of course the prey items that they're eating. Uh, but bird prey items don't have equal amounts of carotenoids. These first two bars are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of, of insects and arthropods. Third bar is orthopteroids, things like grasshoppers and crickets and katydids. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves, far fewer carotenoids uh, because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillars that eat the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way over here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does carotenoid content influence how birds choose their prey items? Well, Ashley did another study with bluebirds. She put GoPro cameras on the rooftops of bluebird houses, and those cameras took a picture once every second. And the object was to get, get a picture of the birds, the bluebirds, as they were flying into the nest with prey items so that she could identify what the prey item was and see how it, it uh, whether the amount of carotenoids in that prey item influenced how often it was taken by the birds. Well, she had a lot of uh, GoPro cameras and a lot of bluebird boxes and she did it for three years. So she had over a million pictures to go through. But when she did, she had uh, 7,628 pictures that were good enough to identify the prey item. And sure enough, she got a good relationship. Caterpillars are brought back more often than anything else. And they had the highest level of carotenoids followed by crickets that had the next highest level. And then everything else was uh, nestled down here in the end. So it really does look like uh, one of the criteria that birds are looking for when they're hunting for prey items is carotenoid level. As a matter of fact, in total, it's looking like carotenoids or caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. It's really looking like they are essential components of bird diets, which simply means birds need caterpillars. But the question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough? Maybe one or two a day? Well, let's go back to chickadees and ask that question. We have a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to get the birds to the point where they leave the nest, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, but they're flying all over the place so nobody can count how many that is. And if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, and you do because that's in so many places, that's the only option left to them. You need all those caterpillars right in your yard because the chickadees forage about 50 meters from the nest. And this is true for most birds. They're not, they're not foraging very far from the nest. That takes too much energy. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot, that's for sure. And if you don't landscape in a way that has that many caterpillars in your yard, that's called insect decline. And it's really starting to look like insect declines are tied very closely to bird declines. We went to the original data set of uh, Rosenberg et al. That's the group that said we have lost uh, 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we, we divided the terrestrial birds up into species that require insects at some part of their life history and species that do not. So things like uh, finches and doves can actually reproduce on seeds. They don't need insects. They gained some numbers over the last 50 years. But the species that require insects on average lost 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that there's a tight link there. So if we want birds and all the other things that eat insects, uh, and particularly caterpillars, and it's a lot of, of different species, we need to start landscaping in ways uh, that produce a lot of insects, particularly caterpillars, which is exactly the opposite of the way we've landscaped in the last century. We've considered all insects to be bad and we wanted to landscape, uh, you know, if we, we thought that uh, our plants were all decorations, we didn't want anything to eat them. So we landscaped in a way that had no insects and created very dead landscapes. All right, if we change that approach, how do we add caterpillars to landscapes? You do that by adding the plants that support those caterpillars, that make those caterpillars. Seems easy enough, but there is a catch. And that is that most plants don't. 
make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be very fussy about which plants we choose to put in our landscapes if we want to have vibrant food webs. And the monarch butterfly is a perfect example. Um, you can have all the all the calorie pear and crepe myrtle and boxwoods and burning bushes and all the other Asian plants that we love in our landscapes. And you won't make a single monarch because the only thing they can reproduce on is milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that that 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They're simply too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And insects can't adapt to all of them, or a single insect can't adapt to all of them. So instead, it picks one or two lineages with very similar cocktails, and it gets good at getting around them. Um, so it, for example, this is the specialization. They develop, develop specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, specialized behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that allow them to avoid uh, exposure to those compounds. But all those adaptations um, take a long time to develop. They don't occur overnight. And this is why when we bring plants in from other continents, most of our insects cannot eat them. Those plants have not been here long enough, thousands and thousands of years, believe it or not, for our insects to be able to adapt to them and use them productively. So what I'm trying to say is that plant choice really matters here. If we're trying to reconstruct food webs, if we're trying to get that energy from plants to other animals, we have to choose the plants that uh, are palatable to our local insects. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well this works when you do choose the right plants. And I'm going to start with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I'm sitting in this window right now. Uh, we got 10 acres of a farm that was broken up not that long ago. A very old farm, been farmed for 300 years um, and it was exhausted. So the, the last thing they did before they sold the farm was to mow it for hay. But in this part of the country, there's so many invasive plants from Asia. What you're really mowing is multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and autumn olive and, and uh, bush honeysuckle and porcelain berry and on and on and on. And you call that hay. So of course, when we started to build the house, the mowing stopped and this is what came back, all the, in, the invasives. Uh, all the 10 acres covered with invasive species. That's my wife, Cindy, getting ready to clear the land uh, of, of our invasive species. Uh, and she did it. So if you have a, a serious problem with invasive plants from, from Asia, um, don't despair. It is a lot of work. There is no doubt about it. But Cindy did it. Uh, and if Cindy did it, you can do it. What was I doing while Cindy was working hard? Well, I was telling her she was doing a great job. But I also was putting plants back. And I did it kind of selfishly. Um, I have this hobby of taking pictures of caterpillars I've never seen before. Kind of strange, but that's what I do. And this is one I hadn't seen, the Canadian owlet. So I said, well, what plant does a Canadian owlet need in order to be on my property? That's what the adult looks like. It needs meadow row. We didn't have any meadow row, which is why the Canadian owlet wasn't there. I'm sure there was meadow row in our property hundreds of years ago, but long gone. So I got some seeds from meadow row, planted them, grew very nicely. But you know, this was early on and I, I really had very little faith that the Canadian owl would be able to find my meadow roo. I don't know of any meadow roo around here. Maybe they had to come from Canada, who knows? So I didn't go out and check my meadow roo. I should have, because after a month and a half, I walked by my meadow roo and, and uh, they were practically defoliated. The Canadian owlets had found them right away, somehow, mysteriously. Um, so that worked really well. And now I've got a, a great population of both meadow root and Canadian owl. So I've added two species to the property. Same thing with the goldenrod stowaway, which is a misnomer, by the way. This beautiful yellow moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It is a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. I did know where there were some Bidens uh, nearby, about 14 miles away in a power line cut. So I got some seeds, planted them. They grew really nicely. Now, this wasn't quite as fast. It took a, a year 
for the uh, goldenrod stowaway to find the bidens, but now it has good population of both. So now I've added four species to the property. Same thing with the Hackberry Emperor. That's a butterfly that ought to be on our property, should be there, but as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry and we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted hackberry. It took four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry, but they finally did. I walked by one of my hackberry plants this June and on a single branch, there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars. Um, so doing quite well, added six species to the property. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own and along with it came many of the specialists that eat goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now this is the goldenrod flower moth. Uh, this is one that has not come to our property. I don't know why it hasn't come to the property and that's what the caterpillars look like. So this is, this is anticipation. This is like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and look for the, the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years, I'm gonna find it and that'll be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I don't know why people don't like Virginia creeper. It's good fall color. It can climb our trees without strangling them, without pulling them down. And it supports a lot of caterpillars, particularly the big sphinx moths that are the primary food for uh, many of our breeding cardinals. Things like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the Lettered Sphinx, the Hog Sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx, all on Virginia Creeper. I wanted to see if I could get the Zebra Swallowtail uh, at our house. Now this is pushing it because we're north of the northernmost population of Zebra Swallowtails in this area. The, we're 26 miles north of the closest one that I know of. Zebra Swallowtails, of course, are specialists on pawpaw. We didn't have any pawpaw, so I planted pawpaw uh, and we had to wait nine years. Uh, so it did take a while, but finally that population of zebra swallowtails did find our pawpaw. In the meantime, we got the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx and lots of pawpaws. One of the double tooth prominent because it's just such a cool looking caterpillar. It's a specialist on elm, so I planted American elm. The caterpillars came right away. One of the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. So I planted evening primrose, they came, the, the adult moss sits in the flowers during the day, it's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now these are just examples of the plant lineages we put on our property. But I wanna focus on oaks for a while because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, it's enormous. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. Uh, and it reminds me that I hear all the time from people, I'm not gonna plant it oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Um, well, unless you die before the next year, you can enjoy what your oak is doing for your, your property. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. Um, and found immediately, they started to attract the moths to my property that run the food webs that support everything else. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange, uh, yeah, orange headed epicolema, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heteracampa, the oblique heteracampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves here. And here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating the leaves of that pin oak. So you don't have to wait centuries for your oaks to start to contribute to the ecosystem in your yard. This is a picture of what our, our yard looks like now. I'm still sitting in that window right up there. Um, I show you this just to, to emphasize it. We put plants back. We do have lawn. We're very traditional. But um, so many moss species have come to our yard because of the plants we put back that four years ago, I made it a goal to take a picture of every species of moss species I could find on our property. I'm still doing it, I haven't finished, but I'm up to 1,031 species of moss that I've taken a picture of on our property. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Now we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land area, uh, we have 40% of all the moss species found in the entire state of Pennsylvania. 
and because most of these are are uh, essentially bird food they're species that the birds eat we've recorded 59 species of birds terrestrial birds that have bred on our 10 acres which is 38 percent of all the terrestrial bird species in the entire state of pennsylvania this fall we saw this headline the world wildlife fund said says that uh, earth has lost two-thirds of its wildlife since 1970. but i'm thinking not at our house I, I bet we have increased biodiversity by at least two thirds at our house simply by putting the plants back, which is, encourages me. We can turn these frightening, terrible headlines around if we just start treating the land a little bit differently, start sharing our spaces with the plants that support everything else. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres and, and you live in a suburban lot that's much smaller. Will it work on small suburban lots? Well, let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house. They have 0.6 acres in Kirkwood, Missouri, uh, in the middle of a development. So they're surrounded by, by standard uh, housing. Um, the invasive plant that's very common in Kirkwood, Missouri is bush honeysuckle. So the first thing they did was get rid of their bush honeysuckle and they planted a lot of native plants and then they put in a, a water feature they call a bubbler. Uh, and then they sat back and started to use count the plants, count the plants, count the birds that were using their property. So on 0.6 acres in suburban Kirkwood, Missouri, they have recorded 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, on our 10 acres, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. Does it work on smaller properties? Yes. But what about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, right over that wall there is one of the runways for O'Hare Airport. Right over here is the Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. But she did the same thing. She uh, got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature, and then she sat back and started to count the birds that have used her yard. She's up to 117 species of birds that have used her yard, including a, a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. If you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Chicago and check it out. Pam is, is isolated. She's not near any natural area, so that little tenth of an acre was powerful enough to do all this. But what about city centers? 82% of us live in cities. Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant, butterfly weed, Sclepias tuberosa. We call it butterfly weed, but that reminds me that we have a serious marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed. Let's call it monarch's delight. Okay, I was staring at Monarch's Delight 2014. The first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bees, megachylid bees. I know they're megachylid bees because they carry their pollen on their tummy. Where's my pointer? Right there. Not on their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very strict requirements. Not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they also need soft leaves, like what you would find on a red bud, because they cut the edges of those leaves out and leave little semicircles. Then they roll up the semicircle into a tube, stuff it full of pollen, and lay an egg on it, and that's where their young develop. Uh, Heather Holm took this picture. This is uh, a three such tubes stuck together in a, in a crack or crevice. So when you find that, I often find these in the nozzle of my watering can. That's not good, but that's what megachylids are doing. Um, there was a red bud right next to the, the monarch's delight. And I'm sure that's why there were megachylid bees. And I'm pretty sure that's why there were bumblebees there as well. Remember bumblebees over winter as queens, so when they emerge in the in the spring, they have no worker to help them out. So the queen has to do all the work and it's it's copious flowers on plants like uh, redbud that occur early in the season that allow bumblebee queens to succeed in getting that colony starting. Well, there were bumblebees there, so I'm pretty sure the redbud had a lot to do with it. And then I saw a monarch, actually I saw two monarchs. Now remember, this is this is 2014. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch in Southeast Pennsylvania. That was the low point of the monarch population in the East. Only 3.6% of the monarchs remained. Um, so, and this was June, this is very early for monarchs to be uh, this far North. So I was encouraged, maybe the monarchs weren't gonna disappear after all, very encouraging. Why were they there? Well, there was monarchs delight, but there was also this species of milkweed. I think it's purple milkweed, which meant the monarchs had forage, but they also had host plants. They could, they could lay their eggs and reproduce. 
Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. And this is the strip of nature we're talking about here. The High Line is a, an abandoned, um, was an abandoned railroad that had been abandoned for many years. People went up and looked at it. It was a lot of native plants were growing there on their own. Nobody taking care of them. So they decided to make it a tourist destination, sunk some money into it. And now it is a tourist destination. Millions of people go to the High Line every year, right in the middle of Manhattan, 30 feet above the taxis to see this little strip of nature. This is Rick Dark. Uh, he was always after me to go see the High Line, see the beautiful plants on the High Line. I'm not much of a city city boy, so I dragged my feet in, in saying yes. But finally, we got there. There's, there's the Monarch's Delight. Um, and there were pretty plants there. But, you know, for me to see pretty plants with nothing using them is actually depressing. Uh, but I was wrong. There were plenty of things using them. Somebody's just finished a, a study of the bees on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. It's over 30 species of, of native bees using these species. So, you know, my preconception that nothing would be there was totally wrong. And it, it proved to me that thoughtful native plantings are capable of bringing life back to the middle of Manhattan, which means this can work anywhere. But there are four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed. And one of them is we've got to shrink the area that's in lawn. We have too much lawn. We've got over 40 million acres of, of lawn nationwide. Um, that's bigger than the size of New England. New England. And of course, the way we treat our line, it's, it's an ecological deadscape. Remember about using all the earth for ecosystem services? This doesn't cut it. So let's cut the area of lawn in half. I, I understand why we have lawn. It is a status symbol. Uh, it shows that we are, we are, uh, we recognize what the cultural norms are and, and we, you know, we're going to be good citizens and, and manicure that lawn. But we can do all that. We can manicure the lawn we keep. Let's just cut the area in half. And if we do that, if we cut the area of lawn in half, that'll give us 20 million acres to use towards conservation. And if we do it at home, we can create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. Uh, and it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. At all this park, still less than 20 million acres. We will have the biggest national park in the country. What are the benefits of putting a park at home? There are a num number of them. One is that you get to develop a personal relationship with some part of the natural world at your own pace, your own, your own time. All you have to do is walk outside. You can do it avoiding crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, millions of people there. It's also free. You don't have to pay admission and it's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the road. No travel hassles. But you know, the big one is you get to experience the natural world alone. I don't know how you're gonna develop a personal relationship with the natural world uh, unless you are alone. And this is particularly important for our kids who are discovering the world for the first time. Richard Lou says our kids are, are suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour to a natural area and they walk around for an hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. And they get back on the bus and, and they go home again. And I'm sure that's better than nothing. But what they've really experienced is a bus ride, 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have part of the natural world and home, they can go outside and discover it all by themselves alone no parental supervision, let them risk it. Most of them will get make it back alive. And that will allow them to develop the personal relationship that will enable them to become good stewards of the planet. Our kids are the future stewards of the planet. And right now they are poised to be terrible stewards because they don't know anything about the planet or the natural world that supports us. And maybe they will learn to hunt lizards. I have learned this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, uh, who lives in Hawaii. And she sent me this picture to show me how to hunt lizards on her patch of nature, which isn't all that natural. It's lawn plus a hedge, but there are unknown lizards there. So this is how you do it. You get on the ground and you disguise yourself with sticks and leaves so the lizards don't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business here. Uh, you can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch it, you put it in an aquarium, you've got that personal relationship with that part of the natural world. Now, I don't think Zoe is gonna be catching lizards on the ground uh, like this the rest of her life, I don't think. Uh, but I guarantee she will remember catching lizards in Hawaii uh, the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's gonna 
going to be a good steward of the planet because of that experience. If you want to expose your kids to more than lizards, uh, get this book, Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti, giving you lots of examples of, of what kids can do right in their own yards. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, go to our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org. Uh, and get on the map. Uh, you can put in your the data of where you are planting natives, where you're restoring uh, the ecosystem. It can be just a matter of feet. Uh, or if you already have a preserved area in your property, um, put in your data and then your area is going to light up. So where are we, Indiana here? It will light up and we can go visit your county, see what else is doing it. This is an effort to um, reach beyond the choir. I've been talking to the choir for 12, 15 years now, and we've got to hit the people that never hear this. So this is a social media attempt to uh, get people to understand that their piece of the world is important um, and they can join a lot of other people. And we can see the whole US light up here. Now the goal is to get 20 million acres on the map, uh, but why stop there? I mean, let's, let's get the entire country on the map. Okay, we're gonna shrink the road, uh, the road. We're gonna shrink the lawn. And um, what are we going to plant in the areas that we take out of lawn? Some of those plants have to be what I call keystone plants. Now remember what a keystone is. You have the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone right in the middle. If you take that stone out, the arch collapses. Keystone plants are so important in our food webs that if we take them out of the food web, the food web collapses. I'm talking about the 5% of our native plants that are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. 14% of our native plants make 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs, which means 85% of our native plants aren't contributing all that much. So uh, they're, they're good. We want them, but we absolutely need these guys. If you're building a house, you have to have two by fours. You can't build your house out of, out of wallpaper. That's the role of keystone plants. So the question is no longer simply are natives better than non-natives in terms of supporting wildlife. On average, they certainly are, but there are a lot of natives that aren't all that good either. They're just too well protected. So the question really is, do we want ecologically productive plants in our yard or benign plants or even worse, ecologically destructive plants like those, those calorie pears that escape our yard and become biological pollution and ecologically castrate all the land around us? I get an email uh, maybe once a year now from people saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba, actually grew in North America? They're from Asia now. They grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. Uh, and that means we can plant them and everything would be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but that's not an argument I'm going to have because that's not our metric anymore. Our metric is how productive are they? I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago. They produce essentially zero species of caterpillars. There's two host records, very rare, uh, but you're never going to find a caterpillar on a, on a ginkgo. Um, so you plant them. It's sitting there taking up space, but it's not adding productively to the local food web. What's adding more than anything else? In 84% of the counties of North America, it's the genus Quercus, oaks. They support 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic uh, uh, states. That's 557 species of bird food, over 900 species of caterpillars nationwide. No other genus comes close to that. Here's an example of what keystone oaks are doing in my yard. Now remember, I've taken pictures of 1,031 moss species so far. I'll get to the butterflies someday. Out of that 1,031 species, 907 have known host plants. So there's over 100 where I don't know what they're eating. Excuse me, I'm burping up my lunch. <laughs> Of the 907 species, 267 species use oaks. Now we have 69 genera of native woody plants in our property, woody plants. Only one of them is, is Quercus oaks. And we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. But they're supporting almost 30% of our moss species diversity and who knows how important they are to the birds in our in our yard. Imagine what would happen to the diversity on our 10 acres if we took oaks out of the system. That's the power of a keystone plant. How do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the most powerful plants uh, in your county, both woody plants and herbaceous plants will pop up. Now, these are abbreviated lists. I just ran out of room, but uh, I can guarantee oaks are gonna be number one. Uh, followed typically by uh, native prunus, so things like black cherry and pin cherry, 
uh, American plum, native willows are very high and lots of, of these other things. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. You can go to the nursery. If you say, I wanna buy a cherry, chances are, are almost 100% that they will sell you an Asian flowering cherry. I wanna buy a willow. They'll sell you a weeping willow from, from Turkey. I wanna buy a birch, they'll sell you a European birch. I wanna buy a maple, they'll sell you a Japanese maple. You've gotta specify that you want a native member of these, these genera. These are native genera, but there are non-native members. And if you get the non-native member, you've reduced caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. These are the top producing uh, herbaceous uh, genera. And of course, as you move into the prairie states, you've got uh, you know, lots and lots of, of choices here. But goldenrods are always very high. 110 species of, of caterpillars on goldenrod. Aster genera are high. Um, sunflower is very high. Out of those three uh, groups of, of genera, not only do they make a lot of caterpillars, but they're, they're the highest ranked in terms of supporting specialist caterpillar, I mean, specialist bees. Over 40 species of bees uh, are using those three genera. So if you don't have those genera in your, your yard, you have just lost 40 species of native bees that could be there if you did have them. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put keystone plants in our yard. Lots of insects are going to come to our yard, and then we're going to kill them at night with our security light. And that, of course, is not the goal. Uh, a lot of research, particularly out of Europe, is, is uh, coming out that suggests strongly that light pollution at night is uh, one of the major factors reducing insect populations. They're killing insects by, uh, through exhaustion, collisions, incineration, dehydration, increased predation by bats and other things. Bright lights blind a lot of our night insects and it keeps them from doing what they ought to be doing. To me, this is actually good news because if this is a major cause, if light pollution is a major cause of insect declines, it's the easiest one to turn around. Just flick a switch, turn your light out. I know what you're gonna say. I can't turn my light out because uh, the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your security light. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. Uh, and the first thing you're gonna find out is the bad man doesn't come very often. If you don't wanna do that, take the white light out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb's the best because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to insects than are the white lights. If we switched out our white uh, night lights for yellow LED lights overnight during the summertime, we could save billions of insects and probably billions of dollars too because they're the most energy efficient. All right, we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants. We're gonna turn out our lights and then we're gonna kill all the insects by hiring mosquito gel. This is a major industry across the country now, um, mosquito fogging. The mosquito gel will tell you that uh, it's okay because this is a natural product and it is a natural product. It's pyrethroids um, made from chrysanthemums, but you know, cyanide is a national product too, uh, natural product too. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's okay. Uh, he'll also say, well, this only kills mosquitoes. That's, that's not even close to true. It kills all the insects that comes in, in contact you. The big deal here, the two things, it's expensive and it doesn't work. So why do we do it? In order to kill and to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of the adults. This kills 10% of the adults. It's not even close to working. What we really need to do is try to control mosquitoes in the larval stage. And this is the most directed way to do it, where it kills mosquitoes and nothing else. You get mosquito dunks. Get a bucket, fill them full of water, fill it full of water, put in strayer, straw or hay, let it ferment for a couple of days. This is in the warm weather and it becomes irresistible to mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs. They lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you put in a mosquito dunk, Bacillus thuringiensis. You get this at the hardware store. It is not expensive. Uh, the eggs hatch, the larvae feed on your mosquito dunk, and uh, it, is a, it is a disease that kills aquatic diptera. And that's the end of the mosquitoes. If a, if a dragonfly lays an egg in there, uh, it's not gonna hurt it. If your dog licks it or a bird drinks it, no problem. It's only gonna kill mosquitoes. If everybody did this, it actually would work. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do uh, is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, uh, actually complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the tree, <clears throat> eats the leaves, then they spin a cocoon and hang from the, the branch, then the adult emerges and they do it all again. 
but that's unusual. Most of the species, 94% of them, drop from the tree when the caterpillar is finished growing and wiggle their, their way beneath the ground and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And we mow and compact our soil so much that the caterpillars can't get underground. So typically, the way we landscape becomes an ecological trap. We're calling in uh, adults, moths, to lay their eggs on our trees. Caterpillars develop, they drop down, and they die. And the next generation smaller, and the next generation after that is gone out altogether. I'm convinced that this type of landscaping, by not treating the area under the tree responsibly, is a major cause of insect declines. And the cement landscape, of course, is even less of a viable option for our caterpillars. I am not trying to discourage the use of, of uh, trees in cities. I'm trying to discourage the profligate use of cement. Um, <coughs> excuse me. That's just laziness. We know it destroys our watershed. And by the way, cement is a major emitter of, of CO2, greenhouse gas. This is what most people do. They, they plant a tree and they put it in the middle of their yard. Nobody's measured how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they do better in a situation like this where you have a layered landscape. You've got a tree, then you have uh, maybe a dogwood here and then a uh, 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 native azalea and ferns and ground cover. Caterpillar drops down, it's a safe site. They can easily get below the ground. Nobody's gonna step on them. Nobody's gonna mow, on, mow them. They can find plenty of leaf litter to spin their cocoon in and survivorship will be much higher. Uh, this is a place you can do your spring ephemeral gardening, and this is how you shrink the lawn. Put beds around your trees. Safe sites. This is where you can use your your uh, all your ground covers, like like uh, uh, native ginger, wild ginger, um, native pachysandra, foam flower, may apples. There's lots of of uh, ground covers you can use, and it creates safe sites everywhere. Ferns. This is this is a hotel in uh, Athens, Georgia. Uh, but look, any caterpillar developing on these, these red maples can drop down and actually complete their development. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, has done some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Uh, and the results of her study uh, suggest that there is room for compromise in our plant choice, and that's good news. What she did was compare the sustainability of chickadee populations in landscapes that were, lands were, were uh, planted primarily in, in native plants versus landscapes were dominated by introduced non-native plants. And when the landscapes were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of chickadee food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Now there's a nest box in each one of these landscapes. So chickadees came and, and looked around and they said, there's not enough food here, we're not even gonna try. If they did try, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, those nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. Now, if you put all that data into, all those data into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of woody non-native plants in your landscape, this is what you get. This dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, it's a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you reproduce at this rate, make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies than adults die, you have a shrinking, unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap generously, uh, which suggests that you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass, uh, non-native, and still have a functioning sustainable uh, food web that can support your birds. But if you exceed 30%, so if you have 50, 75% of your, your landscape non-natives, you're way into this zone and it's an unsustainable population. So I love this study for two reasons. This is the first time this has been uh, shown for any bird anywhere which uh, if anybody's doubting that your choice of plants actually impact uh, higher trophic levels, things that require the insects on those plants, this is a good study to look at. But it also, this is the area of compromise I'm talking about. You can have your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your boxwood, anything that's not invasive, as long as it doesn't dominate the landscape without destroying the, the food web. And that's good news to me because we love our non-native plants. And if I said you can't have a single one, nobody would be listening. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence 
of native plants. So let's load our landscapes with these guys. We can still have these and enjoy them. Can we get a pollinator garden into a, a uh, landscape like this, a typical suburban landscape without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a little fence around it. Beautiful. It services a number of species of native bees. It's not very big, but if everybody did it, um, it would really help our, our native bee declines. You know, we hear all the time, you want pollinators because they pollinate our crops. But you know, a lot of people think, well, if I don't live next to a farm, I don't need any pollinators. Forget the, the crop argument. Um, you need pollinators and you need them everywhere because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of our, our uh, the plants on the planet. And that simply is not an option. What about, what about this? This is a Drew Latham design. So is the other one, by the way, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is here. Seems like a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Uh, yes, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost sharing plan where they're encouraging homeowners to replace uh, some or all of their lawn with uh, appropriate prairie plants of, of Minnesota. You get paid to, to do that. Florida, there's an island of Florida that's paying its residents to allow uh, burrowing owls, listed species to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. Pay people. If you've got an endangered species in your property, you get paid to take care of it as instead of fined in case you use your, your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Missouri uh, and Fayetteville, Arkansas have had uh, bounties on calorie pears. Take out a calorie pear, one of the most invasive plants you can, you can put in your yard. Uh, and you get a free tree replacement then uh, even, even uh, public utilities are getting to the act. In San Antonio, San Antonio Water System, giving people $100 coupons to replace water thirsty plants with, with water efficient native species. Buffalo, New York's giving people $100 coupons to increase the amount of natives in, in their yard. So it is working. And then of course, you've got the, the lawn replacement programs in the far west, like, like California, two, up to $2 per square foot rebate if you get rid of your thirsty lawn and put in appropriate xeric plantings very popular programs. I think we've made three missteps in our early years of, of, of conservation. And this is the first one. We like nature. We, some people can even be convinced that it's important, but very few people think it's essential. And that's the misstep. If it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are short, nature always takes a back seat. And we see that every day, every day of the year. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo not long ago before the virus broke out. And there was this wall size poster here, which epitomizes what our society thinks of conservation. Uh, we're gonna save, save nature so that future generations can enjoy it. I mean, this, is, this was Teddy Roosevelt's argument. We're gonna make national parks so that future generations can en enjoy them. Uh, and that's definitely true, but it suggests nature is there just for, for entertainment, meaning it's not essential. It's far more than entertainment. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. Much more urgent. Second misstep, we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but by restricting conservation just to areas where there's not a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those areas aren't big enough anymore. David Quammen has a, a really great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functioning Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That is 71 rug fragments, none of which are functioning like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. I hate that language because it, it suggests that there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so, every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including the edges of our, our agriculture. <clears throat> so what we need to do is glue our rug back together again. We need to fill in these, these white spaces with viable habitat, not just make biological carters where plants and animals can move back and forth between habitat, but to create viable habitat right where we humans live, work, play, farm. That means we're gonna add those keystone plants, plenty of them, we're gonna share our spaces with nature. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet, but I have no idea why. Because every person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. 
So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good earth stewardship? Stan Reshworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We're great at teaching this one. We are terrible at teaching our kids and our, our peers that we all have obligations towards earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, although it is a good living, but you can save it where you live. And I love this approach because it empowers each one of us. So many of us feel powerless now. The year's problems are huge. You feel like there's nothing one person can do to make a difference, but not so. Go outside, plant that oak tree, plant a shared, plant a willow, plant, put in a, a pollinator garden, shrink your lawn, take out your invasive plants and watch the ecosystem blossom. Watch everything come to your yard and thrive. You did it, one person. That empowers you, it makes you a, an important cog in the wheel of, of conservation. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You'll get depressed. Just worry about your little piece of the planet. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you're gonna focus. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded, short staff, they will love you. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. Now I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Doug. That was a fantastic, beautiful presentation, very inspiring and I think we'll, uh... We'll go out and get our uh, mosquito dunk going here. <laughs> Great. Um, hey, our, our next, uh, before we do just a few Q&A items, uh, we're going to do a little door prize for, for two of your books. Um, the first one is for bringing nature home. And uh, let's see here. Uh, and I'm just going to, uh, I have a hat here and I'm pulling a, a, a participant number out of the hat. We just created numbers for every participant that registered and created them, uh, mixed them up. And I just pulled out uh, registrant number 100. So if you are uh, Fred Loeffler, we've got your email uh, and we'll be in touch with you to get you your copy of Bringing Nature Home. Um, the second uh, drawing which is for the living landscape book that you did with rick dark that i just find um fascinating i've got on my coffee table and my partner sarah who's a landscape architect we cannot get enough of it uh, just amazing the winner of the living landscape book is registrant 186 which is uh, uh diane mason so diane we will be in touch with you over email that you provided uh and with that i'd like to um get over to, to uh, Kevin Allison for the first question uh, of the, uh, the, the Q&A session. All right, Professor Tallamy, we, we've got a few questions that came in over email um, and then we've got some in the chat that we'll go through. So we'll just do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, you talked a little bit about a little bit about oak tree companion plantings. Um, I think you mentioned mentioned ginger and may apple. Are there any shrubs um, that you find work well in companion with oak trees? Well, Chris, oaks are acid loving plants, so um, there's a whole whole bunch of them that do well in an acid situation. All of all of the uh, native azaleas, for example. Um, but oaks, uh, there are I shouldn't shouldn't categorize them totally as acid. There are oaks that actually do well in basic soils. So um, witch hazel uh, would be a good one. Um, viburnums, uh, any of the native viburnums uh, would make very good companions under, under our oaks. If you give your, your, your bed around your tree enough space, um, these plants can thrive under oaks. Uh, but that's a considerable amount of space. You don't want to plant them right next to the trunk because then there's serious competition with, with uh, you know, uh, both light and, and water. But get them out a little bit uh, so that they get them sun, some sun themselves. And then, then underneath those, you can go for all those ground covers and flocks. There's all kinds of them. I haven't found anything that dies under my oaks, even though they may, uh, you know, maybe 
the acidity isn't isn't that great for them. But they all they all seem happy. So. Great, thanks. Um, and before we get to the next question, Fred actually said that he has your book. So I he <laughs> suggested the next person be drawn. I want to show the hat too with all the drawings. I didn't have my camera on earlier. Originally, I was going to have my seven-year-old do this, but he didn't. He hasn't made it back yet. Uh, so I just drew 109, which is Peggy Foster. And um, Peggy, we have your email. We'll be in touch with you. Um, Doug, one. Uh, one person asked about uh, invasive honeysuckle. They've got about a 10 acre woods and want to get that under control. I mentioned a few resources we have up on our website, but do you want to just talk a little bit about the process of replacing uh, invasives with natives on that kind of scale? First, you got to get rid of the, the invasives. Uh, it is a, a lot of work. Um, you have to kill the rootstocks or they, they come back what I do is something like, I, I assume she's talking about bush honeysuckle. Um, I saw it off at the base. Uh, and, you know, I tried doing this without the use of any herbicide. And I realized I'm not going to live long enough. Uh, so I paint the trunk with a little bit of, of herbicide. And it's not much material, but it does kill the roots. Sometimes you have to do it more than once. So, it, um, it's, you know, can't be that toxic if it takes more than once just to kill them. Uh, but then they're dead. And then you've got, you know, it's fun piling up the big bodies and they actually rot pretty quickly. Uh, but then you have the option of, of the opportunity to put in those other, other plants. Now you can add native plants without planting a thing. It's called addition by subtraction. You simply take out the plants you don't want and then let natural processes, the blue jays and the squirrels and everything else to put in the plants that ought to be there. Um, or you can, you can, you know, influence it strongly by planting them yourself. The biggest obstacle to all of that are, are deer, too many deer. Deer love native plants just like insects do. And um, so we, we found that we had to protect particularly our trees um, with wire cages. 10 acres is a big property. You're not going to fence the whole thing probably, but you can have, you get the five foot galvanized uh, uh, cage material, make a big healthy wide cage so you can move it around, let the branches spread out. And in a couple of years, the plant's big enough so that it gets past the point where the deer can, can wreck it. And then I call that graduation, you simply move the plants around or the cages around. Uh, and then you can, beat, you can beat the deer, but uh, we do have way too many deer. We have to get those, those numbers down. Doug, there's a kind of a question to that. Um, is there is there any other strategies um, that might deter deer? Like, um, can you plant like a patch of clover or, you know, plan to give them food in one part of your yard to kind of detract them from another or is kind of the cage thing the best the best route? No, because um, if you increase the amount of food for deer, you're increasing the number of deer. First of all, you'll attract them from other places. Uh, deer eat, they don't just eat clover, they eat browse. They like, you know, the, the tips of lots of woody plants. It's part of their natural diet. So uh, diverting them and hoping they don't eat something that they normally would like just doesn't work. Well, I'm looking for, for, for more questions. You talked about keystone plants. Can you, can you name a few uh, low maintenance plants that really are, are uh, low maintenance and maximize diversity and keystone value? But I know that it's often daunting for folks to get started with mate, the maintenance in mind, but can you, are there some species that the combo of low maintenance and, and high value as keystone is really uh, there? Um, I guess I wonder what you mean by by low maintenance. You mean it's hard to get an oak going, or uh, well, uh, easy to establish and um, maybe a little bit more for formal looking. I'd say acceptable by the neighbors, that kind of thing. Everybody loves an oak tree. Come on. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, well, gee. You know, uh, birches are way up there. Uh, so a lot of people plant river birch uh, and that's, a, that's an important keystone plant. Um, uh, cottonwood, but um, you might think that's not, not as pretty as it could be. Sorry, my brain seems fried right now. 
uh, you know the 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 viburnums are used a, a lot and they can be they can be pruned heavily be fairly formal good blooms um, and they're definitely keystone plants uh, you want to put them in the sun so you get those those good good uh, good blooms I'm sorry I'm giving you lousy answers here but uh, <laughs> It's hard, you know, it's hard to stick a plant in the ground and have zero maintenance. Although I have to say, other than keeping deer off, that's pretty much what we've done at our property. Um, it's a lot of times we don't even plant the plant, the, the blue jays or the squirrels do. And, um, you know, they make it, make it on their own. Um, you know, hawthorn is another really good one that's, that has a great bloom, good berries, uh, and it's socially acceptable. Everybody likes it. Uh, Amelanker, uh, not really a keystone plant for caterpillars, but great for, for early season berries and for pollinators. The hollies, the native hollies, now I'm on a roll here. So things like uh, uh, winterberry or even American holly or, or inkberry. Um, again, not keystone for, for um caterpillars but they're great pollinator plants you wouldn't think of them they're tiny little flowers people don't even realize they're a flowering plant but they are magnets for our our pollinators so they're very important for pollinator plants um, uh, the very important uh, summer blooming plants like clethra uh, sweet pepper bush and button bush Everybody thinks you need to have water to plant those. You don't. They'll do fine in, in, in dry soils. And they bloom in the middle of the summer, which is a hard time to come up with blooms. And they're great for your, your butterflies uh, and your, your, uh, all your pollinators that, that require them. So there, a better list. Thanks. Doug, I know you mentioned that reach beyond the choir, right? Um, so some of these folks are going to be um, just marginally motivated. And we got a question in the chat that, that, you know, we got a question in the chat that said, you know, basically like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to do this, but it's still, it's kind of a, it's, it's a little overwhelming to just, you know, know where to start. Um, what, like, how can we make it easier for people who are, you know, just, just kind of on idle? Right. Um, you know, most people don't garden at all. They hire somebody. They hire a lawn service because uh, they don't want to deal with it. Their lives are complicated. They're doing other things. We need to increase the availability of ecological landscapers or ecological gardeners that can be hired to just do these say, make my yard socially acceptable, make it ecologically uh, um, functional, and then you don't have to worry about it. I'd love to see that become much more, much more common. Starting to happen, and actually in Indianapolis, there are a number of, of good ecological landscapers. So, um, so I'd love to see that expand. But the other thing is, don't think you got to do this overnight. It can be a, a, a hobby. Make it a goal. This year, I'm going to add one tree. You don't have to be a master gardener to do that. Everybody can do that. Um, and and make it the right tree, and you will you will already have started to transform your your yard. Um, there's a lot of resources online these days that didn't used to exist. The uh, of course the uh, every state has a native plant society that can can help out with advice. Um, we could get everybody in the country on board, or at least most people on board very, very quickly if we changed, if we added incentives. Uh, so if we change the tax, tax uh, um, system, where you get taxed for having a lot of lawn and you get tax breaks for reducing the amount of lawn. It's just like the, uh, the motivation to reduce lawn in the water stress states. It worked right away doesn't have to be a big tax benefit, but uh, what it does is says this is what you're doing is now uh, the, the socially acceptable thing. You're a good citizen for doing it. The guy with the big lawn becomes the social pariah now because you're, you're wasting the, the earth. So it's changing the, um, the psychological uh, uh, effects of, of landscaping by, by pre presenting top down uh, motivational uh, aspects like, like uh, um, you know, like those those hundred dollar coupons or tax rebates, anything that says this is the way we need to go in the future. 
So all of that can, can take the person who's only marginally motivated and make them change. And the final thing that I hope is going to happen as, as time goes on is more and more people do it. The most powerful thing that changes behavior is, is what your neighbor's doing. It's peer pressure. That's been shown over and over again. So if, if you all of a sudden look up and you're the last one on your block to, to, uh, to change the way you landscape, um, You'll do it simply, simply so you can fit in. And, I, and we're not there yet for sure, but I hope we get to that threshold and then it'll really take off. Or, or the, you know, the, the wildlife value. A lot of people um, really like birds. They don't care about plants. They don't landscape, but they put out a bird feeder and they want to help the birds. When they realize the plants you put in your yard uh, are, are bird feeders, and they realize the connection, um, then a lot of those people get involved as well. Uh, we had an interesting question here, and forgive me if if Kevin already asked you this. Asked you this, just call me out. But um, could you comment on the importance of working within the constraints of ecological ecological succession when doing large projects? Mm, you know, succession isn't what it used to be because of all the invasive species we have. If you just let it go and let nature take its place the way it would have a hundred years ago. You're going to end up with a, a you know a, a large project full of invasive plants. So, um, so we we have to be much more hands-on in terms of of succession. You can jumpstart uh, succession. So you know you don't have to go through every single step uh, to end up. If your goal is to is to get a uh, an, an oak savanna or something, you can jump right to that. Um, if your goal is to have a forest, you just plant a lot of trees and it will get there a lot faster than if you let it happen on its on its own. So there's no no rule that says you have to go through ecological succession. Um, some plants are much better off in shaded dappled shade when they're young. Uh, so if you put them out in full sun, you know, they might struggle a little bit. But most plants are actually pretty good at, at, at doing that. The big thing is controlling those invasive in any large project. That is what's going to slow you down. All right, Doug, um, the, okay, when excess, or, all right, we're trying to do some landscaping projects. Um, how do we judge cultivar, cultivars when not all cultivars are created equal in value for wildlife? Um, so I guess an example would be this person wants to put a maple in their yard. Um, how, when they go to the store, how do they know which one to choose? And I might preface that with to the Indiana Native Plant Society does have, um, I believe it's them that has like a good list of places in Indiana that you can buy um, native plants. Um, so that's just a good resource too. But is there any tips on when you go to the store, what to expect or, or how to approach that? This is where the knowledgeable consumer has a lot of power. Uh, the, the nurseries aren't all that great at, at telling you what the value of each of these plants are. Most people, they're still convinced that um, we're buying plants strictly for their aesthetics. Uh, and they're, they're just starting to realize that function is becoming an important criteria for a lot of people. So our, our, which cultivars are, are the way to go? Um, first of all, I'd love to see uh, straight species offered so that you have a choice. But uh, if they're not offering uh, straight species, you can ask for straight species. And if they don't have it, you can leave and then they'll start to offer it. But Cultivars to avoid. We've, we've done a project. Uh, this wasn't focusing on flowers. It was focusing on uh, other traits. Looked at six common cultivar traits. And the only one that consistently discouraged insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple. And that, so the red leaf cultivars are common in a number of different plants. That's, you should avoid that because that's definitely taking a productive native plant and making it unproductive by loading the leaves with anthocyanins. Those are feeding deterrents. Um, the other the other traits like uh, taking a tall plant, making it short, didn't have any effect. Adding disease resistance didn't have any effect. Leaf variegation, believe it or not, didn't have any any effect. Enhancing berry berry size didn't have any effect. Now a lot of cultivars, most of them actually are focused on flower traits. And Annie White at the University of Vermont has shown that um, uh, on average there's a much greater chance that changing the characteristics of a flower are going to reduce its function to specialist bees than, um, you know, more often than not. Not always. There are cultivars that actually have increased amounts of, of uh, 
particularly nectar available. Um, so there's, we can't say, you know, cultivars are, are bad and straight species are good. We have to say it depends, but I would be, I would be um, more reticent to get a cultivar of a flower uh, if you're trying to help the pollinators because the chances are, are good that uh, either the pollen nutrition or the nectar load has been changed or the features that attract the pollinator to the plant. You know, a lot of pollinators follow UV light and we don't even see that in the petals. You don't know how that's been changed by the, by the cultivar. Uh, but there are thousands of cultivars out there and 99.9% and .9 of them have never been evaluated for ecological use. So that's where we are. Well, thank you so much, Doug, for, for your time. And uh, it's, it's been a really entertaining evening and inspiring. And I want to thank our, our funders and uh, Indiana Farm Bureau for providing the, the funding for the books as well as our various partners. And I want to encourage everybody to jump on our website. It's marionswcd.org. Check out our annual report and a lot of the resources and workshops we have coming up as well as the election. Thanks uh, again, everybody, and have a great evening. Okay, thank you.